as you can see from this title, uh, uh, here I uh, uh, try to combine uh, two things which uh, may seem to be completely irrelevant. Bicarbonate aqua systems and developmental uh, part, uh, patterns of uh, living organisms. Uh, but uh, since this uh, session is devoted to the memory of the uh, outstanding uh, scientist uh, Emilio Del Giudice, uh, one of the lessons which I got from Emilio Del Giudice, that is how to uh, look, uh, be, uh, to find something in common uh, between things which seem to be completely irrelevant. And then, uh, under the certain angle, you can see that they uh, represent part of some uh, holistic and very vital system. I uh, met, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Emilia uh, was one of the most close uh, friends of, of mine. And uh, when he passed away, I was uh, so much surprised uh, to re uh, recollect that I met him only in 2007, not so uh, long ago but he impressed me so much that he completely changed uh, my life. And I met him at the school, uh, summer school on biophotons and biophotonics, which uh, was, uh, it was already seventh school, which is, uh, was organized by another great uh, scientist of the 20th century by Fritz Albert Pop. He was mentioned already here. And I uh, show here these two, two people who understood that the world is not a collection of things, but the world is a collection, is a holistic and uh, ever-developing whole. I'll just uh, return back to this uh, idea a little more. Here I show that uh, uh, the Emilia Del Giudice presented at, at this summer school uh, on biophotons and biophotonics, where he appeared for the first time, though he, he knew Albert Pop uh, many, many, many years ago, uh, with the lecture, Coherent Quantum Ele Electrodynamic Organization of Biochemical Processes. And when I listened uh, to this lecture, I understood that I can understand quantum physics, though I was a, a pure biologist, you see. This person could explain uh, things which scared uh, usual people, the, uh, such words as quantum uh, 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 electrodynamics or uh, quantum field theory. Uh, you see, usual biologists and chemists will simply close his eyes. Uh, it uh, doesn't have nothing to do with me. I cannot understand this. That's only for very sophisticated physicists. And the great uh, uh, gift of uh, uh, Alberta, uh, uh, of Emilio Del Giudice and Fritz Albert Pop uh, together, that they could uh, explain to uh, laymen uh, these very, very complicated things in very, uh, uh, very uh, simple words with very, uh, a lot of examples which, uh, 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 which uh, show how uh, it is better to look at word from this uh, point of view. In fact, uh, uh, in two words, Emilia helped me to grasp the difference between two alternative views of nature. One uh, view which dominates now because uh, it is imprinted in our brain uh, from the elementary school uh, till the, uh, when we some of us become members of uh, academia. So it's just imprinting that nature is the collection of particles, things, uh, which are passive objects which are moved by external forces. All uh, changes in nature occur due to some external forces, extra external power, external rulers, and uh, all things uh, are passive, including us. We are also passive uh, um, particles in, in the state. There are uh, forces which move us in right direction. So this is, I would say, not scientific, but, uh, but world view uh, of the current uh, world. And uh, Emilia um, helped me to understand that the uh, world is completely different, that nature is the dynamic coherent uh, whole. Uh, that is a family of indivisible uh, quantum physical fields like sky with the, with the clouds. You see, for, for me, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, image of what are fields, just look 
uh, on the sky and you see a lot of clouds there. Are these uh, they particles? Are they things? Can you put them in your pocket, these uh, clouds, but they really exist? They change continuously and so on and so forth. And what is also that these uh, fields provide for the self-organizing universe. It organizes not by the action of some external field uh, uh, force which comes from another u universe, you see, but it is the intrinsic property of uh, this uh, matter which are essentially fields just to become more and more complex and at the same time more and more uh, coherent. Now, uh, uh, it seems to me, well, people should read more, and uh, it's, uh, fortunately, uh, Emilio de Giudici published a lot of uh, papers which are uh, very, very interesting and not very difficult to uh, just uh, any educated person. Uh, but here we are at the conference devoted to water and uh, one of his major uh, um, achievements, uh, uh, impacts in uh, science uh, was uh, together with Preparata and, uh, uh, and um, uh, 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 Giuseppe Vitiella who is present here, uh, that's, uh, they formulated basing on the quantum field uh, theory or on the, quantum base, uh, on the principles of quantum uh, electrodynamics, uh, the uh, application to condensed matter and in particular to water. And uh, from my point of view, uh, they uh, formulated the most uh, comprehensive up-to-date up theory of water. Uh, I'm very thankful to Roberto Germana, who just uh, in the, the first lecture uh, already devoted a, lo a lot of time to this uh, theory, uh, but it seems to me that we should not stop repeating it because when I uh, repeat this, uh, what uh, Emilio taught me, uh, I begin each time I understand it better and better, uh, and I hope other people will also understand. So the major idea, if not to go into any details, is that any water, including the theory, is of course for theoretical water. It's not for real water. It's kind of theoretical water. So the es essential feature of any theoretical water is that it is heterogeneous uh, substance. So it, is, it consists of at least two different phases. Uh, one phase is uh, non-coherent water fraction, which probably very well described by uh, flickering uh, uh, cluster model of uh, uh, textbook model of uh, Van uh, and Frank. And another is uh, coherent domains, which uh, are, uh, I will not repeat uh, in details, but the most essential feature of coherent domains, that coherent domains consist not of water, but already they consist of field, water field, because water in coherent domain are not particles in principle. They can continuously are in oscillating state, so they continuously change their, their, their properties. And one of the major features of this change of their properties is that, and as uh, Roberto already said it, that coherent domain is, uh, contains quasi-free electrons. Electrons are much further from the nucleus of the water of, of uh, uh, hydrogen and so on. So they are quasi-free and uh, one needs only very small external uh, influence in order to make this electron co co completely free and to leave this uh, coherent domain. And as soon as water is H2O, O, or oxygen is always present in water. By the way, it is impossible to get to, to purify water of gaseous oxygen because water in principle, uh, uh, as we feel it, understand it, it is in principle a dynamic non-equilibrium system and it continuously splits into oxygen, hydrogen, then it splits back and so on. So oxygen is always present in water. Uh, such things as photosynthesis and so on, they simply increase uh, the water splitting rate. But uh, if you take even most steel, most pure water, you always, if you have very, uh, very sensitive, uh, 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 sensitive probes, you'll find that oxygen is always present in water. And these electrons, uh, there is the uh, acceptor of electrons in water, that is oxygen. In real water, as we'll see further, uh, it is always present. 
So what it means? It means that uh, coherent domains may uh, donate electrons, and these electrons come to oxygen. And what are the products of oxygen reduction? These products are called reactive oxygen species, starting from superoxide uh, radical, and then uh, uh, superoxide anion radical. In the presence of protons, it converts into superoxide radical. Hydrogen peroxide is the uh, product of recombination of these radicals, of dismutation of these radicals. Hydrogen uh, hydroxyl uh, radical is always, uh, also always present in water. So all these reactive oxygen species, which uh, are called reactive because uh, their uh, life uh, uh, time is very, very short. They uh, immediately recombinate with each other. So this process should continuously go in water. So what it means that if in water there is always oxygen, there are coherent domains which are electron donors, so in, wa in water, one should expect, and that was, uh, 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 that struck me when I listened to uh, Emilio's lecture, when he said that uh, be I believed in this before him, but he completely independently came to the idea that oxygen reduction uh, continuously takes place in water, and, uh, uh, but in fact, this uh, oxygen reduction with electrons plus protons, that is with Ox uh, hydrogen atoms is the essence of the process of any burning. Because if just to think that burning may be without any carbon, then it is like a, 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 you know, burning of hydrogen is the purest burning. So here is the reaction of burning of hydrogen, hydrogen plus oxygen. You have two products of this reaction, OH radical and uh, pure O. Uh, OH radical will react with hydrogen. You again get the product, uh, stable product of this reaction, hydrogen plus uh, water plus hydrogen. Here again, hydrogen. So this reaction is called branching chain reaction. This reaction is kind of an explosion. So all burning processes are branching chain reactions. Uh, these reactions, unfortunately, are not very, uh, very well studied in chemistry because uh, when they were discovered in the 1930s, then next discovery was branching chain reactions uh, in, uh, in atomic bomb, and all, uh, all the uh, attention of scientists was con uh, uh, diverted into the branching chain reactions of the in the, in the nu uh, nuclear uh, science. But in chemistry, these reactions go continuously, and as a matter of fact, I would say that any life is a branching chain reaction. Just think that each cell divides, give birth to two cells, the, each new cell gives birth to two cells, and so on. So this is a branching chain reaction, the most essential reaction which we have. Any branching chain reaction is a tremendous source of energy. Okay, water may burn from theoretical point of view, but as usual, uh, you see, in practice, burning was, uh, in practice, uh, phenomena which are not explained by theory, usually uh, observed and described much before theory appear. And as a matter of fact, burning of water, oxidation of water, was discovered in, seven, in uh, the end of 18th century for the first time by Elizabeth Fulheim. Then it was completely forgotten. Uh, the, uh, Elizabeth Fulheim, she wrote that... Uh, 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 when you burn coal, in fact, you burn water because it is impossible to burn dry coal with dry air. Water should be always present for burning of coal, and it, in, in fact, in burning of coal, oxygen of the air is reduced with hydrogen uh, atoms which are taken from water. And the product of this burning is again water, so that's why coal is burning. And in uh, the beginning of the 21st century, uh, the a real burning of uh, water, as we understand it. It was demonstrated by American inventor John Kanzius, and it was reproduced by Rustum Roy in his uh, laboratory. 
So if you take uh, that's, that's important salt water, uh, have uh, some concentration of salt, and just uh, 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 stepping a little aside, when you have salt water, you have a lot of easy water in this water, of course. And so this water, if, if this water is uh, irradiated uh, by the radio waves uh, of, for example, this frequency and uh, uh, this energy, then water splits so efficiently into hydrogen and uh, oxygen that released hydrogen can be uh, ig ig ignited, <laughs> can be put fire on, and you have the flame temperature of which of atomic uh, hydrogen uh, reaches 100 and, uh, uh, 1,500 degrees. So, in fact, water may burn, and the question is how water may burn for, again, textbook uh, knowledge. Because in order to split a water molecular, you need 12 electron volts. And here is radio waves. Uh, the, the energy of quantum of radio waves is 0 0.000 electron volts and still what is burning. And so the thing is that uh, according to uh, the theory of Preparato del Giudice Vitiello and according to the discoveries made by, uh, uh, by Jerry Pollock, uh, in fact, water consists of two different waters, and in any water there are two different water, two different waters, and one water uh, the, which we call easy water. It is a specific form of coherent domain water, uh, as uh, Emilio de Giudice believed, and I also believe uh, in this. And it is an uh, electron donor. It is when we say it is negatively charged, that means it has excess of electrons, which may be released, and they are really released when uh, uh, Jerry puts two electrodes and electrical current flows. Uh, that means electrons may flow from this water to the uh, positive uh, mm, uh, uh, to, to the positive part of this water. So, in principle, when you have easy water and you have uh, oxygen, under certain conditions, this easy water may donate electrons to oxygen, and you get a very uh, strange, from the point of view of usual chemistry, reaction. Water is burned, and it, is, um, uh, in co it converts oxygen into water, and oxygen of water is converted into oxygen molecular. So chemical reaction of uh, a bird phoenix. You see, bird is burning and reappearing, but the reappearance, of course, of not that water which burned, but reappearance of chaotic water, what we call bulk water. And thanks to the uh, by it, uh, practically uh, infinite energy uh, from outside uh, in the form of infrared radiation and so on, this uh, chaotic water c converts back to into easy water, so this uh, process in principle can go on continuously and it really goes on continuously in nature and in this sense water is not a generator of energy, it is a, a step up, uh, up transformer of uh, energy. It collects the, the energy which is dissipated in the environment and converts it into free electronic excitation energy, high potential energy. But this process, of course, if it goes in even pure water, its intensity is very, very low, though under specific conditions, as uh, um, Roberto Germano has uh, shown you, you still can extract this a free energy from, sip, from most pure water where you have a lot of, uh, a lot of easy water thanks to uh, surfaces of nafion. In fact, in real, uh, in real systems, uh, which in real waters, uh, this process goes much more intensely in most cases. And it goes much more intensely due to presence of catalysts, chemical catalysts. And I... Uh, uh, I suggest that one of the most efficient catalysts of water burning, so the substance which, is, uh, which promotes this process, uh, which pr the process which can go around continuously, is uh, 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 carbon, uh, uh, the, the representatives of the family of carbonates, because there is no real water without uh, at least traces of bicarbonate in this water. 
for example, if you take biological water, biological uh, water, uh, water from living systems uh, contains tremendous uh, uh, concentration of uh, carbonates. For example, in uh, plasma, uh, concentration of carbonates, uh, CO2 and uh, bicarbonate, uh, reaches uh, nearly 30 millimolar. And by the way, decrease of this uh, concentration is very dangerous to, to, to the health. In cells, it is less, but still it's enough. And uh, here is a good example of highly, of uh, very uh, health uh, water, uh, mm, yes, uh, which is like a drug water, very good uh, donut water uh, from the region which is not so far uh, from here, which contains a lot of magnesium, 40 millimolar of magnesium and 125 millimolar of bicarbonate. Uh, the uh, biological function of carbonate is very well known, I would say, mostly to, lay, to, to ordinary people. Uh, uh, unfortunately, medical uh, society doesn't uh, pay so much attention to bicarbonate and to biological role of bicarbonate. I suspect, more, maybe I'm completely wrong, because it's very cheap. You see, you can go to the uh, drugs, uh, to, to, to grocery and buy... Uh, as, you, uh, how, uh, as much as you like of this uh, stuff uh, for, for practically for nothing. But uh, it was uh, known s uh, already for more than uh, 100 years that carbonates are vitally needed at all levels of the uh, organization of living matter, at the level of the whole organism. If uh, we begin to inhale, exhale, exhale very fast, we uh, lose uh, CO2. And we uh, may immediately lose consciousness because, uh, though it is paradoxical, the uh, CO2, the product of respiration, is needed for respiration. With the when there is deficiency of bicarbonate in the, uh, in the organism, respiration stops. So uh, that, uh, and that is the, 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 the so, so hypoxia, in principle, is not lack of oxygen uh, in living organisms. It is deficiency of bicarbonate. And at the cellular level and at the molecular level, I, do not, I will not go into all this detail, but bicarbonates are very uh, much needed. Usually people think that bicarbonates function as, as acid uh, alkaline buffers, but in fact uh, they uh, play much more uh, deep and uh, sophisticated and much more interesting role. Carbonates participate in the processes associated with generation, transformation, accumulation, uh, utilization of energy in living systems. Uh, so just uh, the uh, hypoxia, I mean the, the uh, deficiency in respiration without bicarbonates is the indication that they are needed for energy uh, uh, processes. And in fact, uh, ed energy related process go, uh, go on in all these waters, so I do not uh, advertise any of them, but any bottle contains uh, bicarbonates, and of course they, can, uh, they contain in, in any baking uh, soda uh, solutions. Uh, so this uh, bicarbonate uh, uh, present in all mineral waters, more or less of them. Now, the, the participation of bicarbonates in uh, bioenergetic processes uh, was proved uh, by few scientists and we also uh, uh, added uh, some knowledge to, to their role uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the energy donating processes. Uh, I uh, spoke uh, last time on the last school uh, about the, uh, on the last conference that using uh, electron paramagnetic resonance method we discovered that con continuous generation of su superoxide oxide radical takes place in bicarbonate aqua solutions. So in all the bottles which stand on your tables, a continuously superoxide radical is, uh, is produced, especially if you shake it, the intensity of uh, superoxide radical production will be uh, much higher. Uh, there is another uh, also indication that uh, all bicarbonate solution contain these reactive oxygen species which are continuously produced in them. And uh, these obs observations show that uh, the, in water which contains bicarbonates, uh, so the intermediate products of, of water burning take place. 
And uh, now I'm just coming to the <coughs> essence of what I'm uh, going to talk about, uh, about which uh, already a little uh, was uh, told by Roberta G Germana. Uh, the, uh, one, can in, uh, when ca one can induce much uh, more intense burning of water if to add to, to water containing bicarbonate a small uh, quantity of hydrogen peroxide. And we demonstrated, uh, and it's published already in several uh, papers, that hermetically closed bicarbonate solutions activated with uh, only five thousandths of a percent of hydrogen peroxide, they burn, they emit photons for many months, even in the complete darkness. Uh, well, how you, uh, one can measure it? For example, here is a test tube with this bicarbonate solution. Just you can take uh, this water from this uh, bottle which is standing on your uh, table, adds very small quantity of bicarbonate there, add a fluorescent compound which is called luminol, and uh, so put it near the photomultiplier, and this solution will emit photons. Here is just a recording, one week recording of photon emission from uh, one test tubes. Uh, this is uh, circadian rhythms, increase and decrease of photon emission during the daytime, first, second, so one week. And practically there is no decay in photon emission uh, from, from this uh, solution during one week. It shines and shines and shines. But this shining starts usually if you simply take bicarbonate solution, add to it it's already times, yes, coming. Yeah, I have five minutes, uh, unfortunately. Now, so about this shining, I'll say you, here is the recording of this shining for uh, one year and a half. So it, you had a test tube. This test tube was standing for nearly two years, and photon emission from this t test tube were, could be recorded starting from uh, 2008 October, and uh, simply we stopped recording in uh, 2010. So uh, more than a half a year and a half, it was, it was shining. And uh, I have five minutes, but I now come only to, to the most important part of my uh, talk. You see, when you make usually many, many, many similar solutions, for example, you have a, a, a beaker with a bicarbonate solution with hydrogen, per, uh, uh, hydrogen uh, peroxide and, and bicarbonate, and you distribute this solution into uh, s s similar test tubes, you should expect that you get similar results. So there should be some scattering of data, but photon emission intensity should be even. But we observe that different test tubes begin to uh, emit very different uh, uh, quantity of, uh, of light. And we decided to study uh, why it happens. So why we prepare, take one and the same solution, distribute it into uh, one and the same uh, naive uh, test tubes and, and get very different results. And we observed that initially, after distribution, here is 28 test tubes, uh, the scattering of photon emission from different test tubes is uh, normal, I would say. Uh, the, after filling, the standard deviation from the mean is 6%. But the day after this, these test tubes were standing together in one and the same place and so on, the photon emission average intensity increased. This is already a red color and standard deviation increased to 50% of the mean. So what it means? It means that after that initially test tubes were nearly identical, what we really expect. But after one day, especially after second day, after third day, here are individual test tubes. They begin to behave tremendously variably. So we distribute one and the same solution into different test tubes, and we finally get very, very different results. So this is the series, the only similarity between them that all of them increase in photon emission. But some increase to this extent, some to this extent, and we studied this phenomenon, phenomenon of reproducible irreprodu irreproducibility. And it turned out that irreproducibility, which is irreproducible, has a lot of uh, common, uh, common traits. One of the, of the traits was that 
uh, here is increased tremendous in standard deviation is not at the stage when photon emission, the intensity of uh, burning processes in these te test tubes is maximal. No, it is, uh, it, it is uh, the largest uh, at the, when they run, uh, the, the, when they attain uh, more and more energy. When they attain more and more energy, they begin to, di to uh, divert from each other. They begin to change their behavior. But then standard deviation begins to, uh, uh, to, to fall down. So what uh, situation we have here? We have situation that you have initially identical or quasi-identical samples. Then the samples begin to behave, e e uh, to, to, to travel uh, on completely different tracks. But then they begin to converge to, to each other. They begin to return, uh, according to standard deviation of the mean, they begin to return to much uh, more similar pattern of, of their behavior. So uh, we uh, could see that this is not random situation. For example, in this diversity, you can see groups of samples which behave like this, group of samples which behave like this, groups of samples which behave like this, but there are some very, uh, uh, very extreme individuals which behave different from any others, but sooner or later they begin, uh, begin to behave similar to each other. Okay, not having too much time, I'll try first to uh, give, yes, to give uh, first the uh, um, working hypothesis, why it happens. It happens because water is heterogeneous. And here is the analogy, uh, why this heterogeneity in water may be reflected in such a behavior. Analogy that water is like sky. When you look at the sky, uh, it may be very clear, but then clouds appear in the sky. Sky is the same, but this, uh, um, uh, the, the, this place at which now there is a cloud has different physical chemical properties. Did it have different, different physical chemical properties before the sky appeared? I suppose yes, because at this place sky, uh, a cloud appeared. So we have skies, and when we take from one and the same beaker uh, same, same uh, portions of water, we either get to the future cloud or we do, do not get to the future cloud, and we have different uh, results. Now, so this is the model of what? This is a very bad thing from the scientific point of view because irreproducibility, unfortunately, is reproducible. So in principle, you cannot have a, a very good uh, reproducibility. But is it uh, some uh, extreme case with this solution or it has something to do with, uh, with nature? And I would say that activated bi bicarbonate solution of common genesis and developing embry embryos belonging to one uh, lane behave in a similar manner. Uh, I would like to ask uh, only one, probably two minutes in order to substantiate this claim. The claim is based on the discovery which was made by the founder of embryology, Carl, Carl von Baer and which was published in a very rare book in Russian and completely forgotten even by embryologists. What Carl Bell, who was studying the development of uh, uh, chick uh, embryos, uh, unlike usual embryologists, he took a big laying of these chick embryos and studied are they alike at stage one, stage two, at day four, five, six, and seven, and he made such a conclusion that the younger are the embryos, the more they are different. Differences may be so big that it becomes a doubtful whether these embryos would produce same adult forms. However, in the course of further development, the differences eliminate and the overwhelming majority of the newborns are similar and do not deviate from the norm. So, uh, apparently identical uh, eggs, they begin to develop at different trajectories but they then uh, they converge and uh, convert into very, very similar chickens. And these very similar chickens, they begin to behave in a different way, and, but then they convert into very, very similar hen and so on. So that's what we are talking about, uh, what uh, was written by Carl von Baer uh, more than 150 years ago, that it is clear that not the preceding stage defines the following by itself. That is the principle of uh, cause and uh, effect. 
So, but the more general and higher relationship determine the development. So maybe natural science does not serve to fir uh, the, the firm foundation of materialist views, views as it is claimed. If to translate it in, into the current language, so maybe natural sciences does not uh, f uh, serve the firm foundation of the particulate atomistic worldview. But rather, on the basis of direct observation, it refutes strictly materialist doctrine and proves that it is not matter, but the essence of the developing, developing animal form uh, manages the development of the fetus. What is es essence of the developing uh, animal form? Is the essence of the developing uh, animal form a quantum field? So is the each uh, chicken is a quantum of a chicken field? Uh, this is an open question. Thank you.